Well, we're working our way through the epistle of Jacob to the 12 tribes. I always love to do that because I get this good quizzical look from my biblical friends. And uh, Jacob, of course, um, is Jacobus in the Greek. It's Jacques in French. It's Iago in Italian, Diego in Spanish, Yaakov in Hebrew, and James in English. And uh, so it is more commonly known as the epistle of James. And uh, there are many Jameses, four at least in the scripture. Uh, James, the son of Zebedee, his brother John, of course, is a very, very well-known uh, brother of the beloved disciple. He was slain by Herod right after Pentecost. We don't believe this was written by him. A couple of other Jameses, I won't go through this each time. We've, we've, we've covered this. But we're obviously, we hold the view that this was the James that was the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not a believer until after the resurrection, as the scripture tells. We do know that Jesus had a number of brothers and possibly sisters listed in the scripture. Uh, that uh, this that James became not only a believer after his resurrection, but rose to be the one of the primary uh, leadership in the church in Jerusalem. And Paul, in his letters, even refers to those that came from Jerusalem as having come from James. He, there's an identity there that is quite uh, significant. James could have been written very late or very early. Either way, it has its supporters. Um, late couldn't be later than 62 A.D., where uh, James himself was martyred. But it, um, in fact, his martyrdom may have been one of the precipitating events in the rebellion that ultimately led to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. There are some scholars that believe this letter, though, may have been written very, very early. There are, are uh, scholastic arguments both ways, and uh, not, not a great moment for our, our rather cursory review. It was written to the 12 tribes. James was Jewish. That's why I like to call him Yaakov. And uh, he wrote to the, his letters addressed to the 12 tribes. And notice there are 12. Ten aren't missing. All 12 are there. And that myth of the 12 tribes we dealt with in our earlier session, but just be sensitive to that. James was very Jewish. His readers were Christians, but very Jewish in large measure. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not for all of us, just as the, all the epistles are to all members of all the churches. So um, there are about 60 imperatives in the letter to James, in, uh, 60 imperatives in about 108 verses. And so many of us may take the snippets, the sound bites of these imperatives and fail to really grasp the thrust of what he's really trying to get across. We shouldn't just carry away from this epistle a lot of do's and don'ts. If, if so, we miss the point. In fact, many have. Many people regard James, the letter of uh, James to be in contradistinction to Paul's letters in each both Paul and James in their own ways deal with faith as the key doctrine in the Christian life. And clearly it is. Faith is, uh, we're, the sinner is saved by faith. We must walk by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And whatever we do apart from faith is sin. So that's clearly plenty of scripture there. But faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of the consequences. And that's really what James is going to focus on. Paul, we tend to see Paul as speaking of faith leading up to salvation. Faith that uh, James is talking about is proof that you have been saved. So it's not different. They just have a different emphasis. And uh, faith is not a feeling that we work up. It's not an emotional thing. It's the confidence that God's word is true. But that if that's true, then we should be acting upon that word uh, to bring a blessing. And it's our walk that is our testimony of our faith. And that's really what, in a number of ways, James is going to hammer away at. And what he's really going to ask, in effect, is the kind of faith that doesn't produce manifest fruit can that save you. He's arguing not that you're saved by works, but that if you have a faith that's saving you, your works will bear witness to that. That's really the point he's going to get across. Widely misunderstood. Those that argue that there's a contradiction between James and Paul fail to have grasped the message of both. Because Paul says much the same thing. It's amazing to me as I stand back, looking at what more than 40 years of Bible studies and, and seeing controversies come and go, it's amazing to me how many difficulties disappear if you start from the premise that these 66 books although penned by more than 40 guys over thousands of years, are an integrated message. Once you accept, for whatever reasons, 
that it's a package, tightly engineered. And once you go at it with the confidence that it all ties together, you discover it does tie together in ways that are breathtaking. And it's one of those things that um, you can't accept from me. That would be a big mistake. You need to discover for yourself. But recognize the reality that it is an integrated package, that every detail there has had the benefit of supernatural engineering. Once you take that position and try to unravel how it ties together, these problems all go away. These problems that I've seen of whatever kind, all seem to spring from some kind of lack of confidence. Well, Moses didn't really write Genesis. You know, that kind of thing. Did he really? On the other hand, if uh, you believe Jesus Christ, he said he did. If you believe Jesus Christ, you know, you don't have any problem with the five books of Moses. If you believe the Gospel of John, you've got no problem with the integrity of the book of Isaiah. John 12. He quotes from Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53 and says that same Isaiah. In other words, he ties that all together as written by the same guy. So if you accept the words integrity, you don't waste your time traveling down these scholastic bio, you know, uh, rabbit trails uh, that make fine PhD theses if you're trying to get a degree from one of these liberal uh, seminaries, but destroy faith. Destroy faith. There is a book out that attempts to tie the Shroud of Turin to the torture and murder of Jacques de Molay in the 13th century. It weaves together a whole bunch of legends, myths, and maybe some real history about the Knights Templar and how they really found the treasures of the temple back in the 12th century, and that became the funds for the European whatever, and, and that these guys... Uh, anyway, gets into the whole Masonic roots and all of that stuff. But aside from all that colorful background, it also weaves this whole tale that the real church teachings were by James were hidden and then later rediscovered by the Knights Templar and that Paul had really, he was a usurper upstart that created Christianity as we know it. It goes through all this stuff. It's so um, embroidered with pseudo-scholarship that someone who has a weak faith could read that and it would totally undermine their perspective of the New Testament. It's amazing. You're going to run into all kinds of that kind of thing because uh, Satan's pulpits are articulate and uh, continuing. All of these things have their refutations. You want to take the trouble to peel the onion, you'll find each one of these things can be shredded with good scholarship. But boy, the energy and time you waste and the risk and danger of falling in quicksand in the meantime uh, is uh, tragic. It's tragic. And it's funny, it fascinates me, whether, whether your anxieties are scientific or whether textual or doctrinal, it's amazing to me to discover how many of those just evaporate when you recognize the integrity of the total package. So spending effort girding your comprehension of the integrity of the package gives you an insulation to all this nonsense that's flying around. Um, anyway... Last time we, in, uh, in the last half, chapter 2 that we took last time, James talks about three kinds of faith. He talked about dead faith. Faith that, you know, can this kind of faith save a person? Faith that works. Can it save a person? And even Calvin, John Calvin said, it, it is faith alone that saves us, but it's faith uh, that justifies us. But faith that justifies is never alone. Calvin's saying the same thing James is, that if you have a saving faith, you're saved by faith, but if your safest faith is saving you, then it will manifest itself in fruit. Now, so James is calling for authenticating actions to prove you really have the faith. So he talks about dead faith. That's a scary thing. Can faith be dead? Yes, indeed. There are many people that have the vocabulary. There are many people that have the intellectual assent. Are they saved? Well, how do I know? Only God knows his heart. I won't pass judgment on that, but I can. We're not called to inspect gifts. We're called to inspect fruit. It takes a second example. Dead faith. He talks about demonic faith. I think he did this deliberately to shock his listeners. You know, the, you say you believe. Devils also believe and tremble. He gives the devils more credit than many parishioners. Because they not only have intellectual assent, they got an emotional response. The devils shudder. That's interesting. There are probably many Christians that believe and they also shudder. 
They may even roll on the floor and do other interesting things. But, but uh, <laughs> that's not the issue. Because are, de- are the demons saved? I don't think so. And the third kind of faith is that which not only has intellectual assent and emotional response, it has a response of the will, commitment. And the mind understands the truth, the heart desires the truth, but the will acts on the truth. And uh, then he used, he used a couple of examples, in fact, very contrasting examples. He used Abraham, a very prominent person, a Jew, and very prominent in the Scripture, and he uses him as an example where his works demonstrated the faith that saved him. And it's not saying that the works saved him, he's saying that the faith was manifest by the works. And then the other example he takes is a, a rather intriguing one. It's a contrast to Abraham. He takes someone as a minor part person, that's a Gentile, that's of ill repute, <laughs> Contrast Abraham, namely Rahab, and uses her as another example. And it fascinated me, and we closed last time, as we looked at Hebrews 11, which is so well known as the Hall of Faith. It goes through sort of a, it's just a survey of the Old Testament, all these great people of faith. And that's where Abraham and Rahab and all these are mentioned. And it's interesting. If you go through Hebrews 11, relabel in your Bible with your own little note, the Hall of Works. It's the Hall of Works. The list of people there. It describes how great their faith was by the works they did. One of the things I'm I'm so grateful for this opportunity to go through the book of James, or Jacob as I like to call it, I do see see faith overemphasized at the expense of works. We are so uh, fearful of falling into legalism with good reasons. Paul talks plenty about that. But we, I think, have failed to really embrace the fact that we're also called to obedience. And that's what James is attempting to deal with. And that brings us, of course, to chapter 3, where James is going to talk about the world's smallest and largest troublemaker. And they're both one and the same. The biggest troublemaker in the entire world is the tiniest troublemaker. The tiniest is the biggest, the biggest is the smallest. He has so far, in chapter 1, he talked about the mature Christian as being a, being very patient in trouble. Chapter 2, he talked about the mature Christian being practicing truth. <laughs> in chapter 3, he disqualifies all of us by saying the mature Christian has control over his tongue. His tongue. Now, we did t- touch a bit on the venomous nature of uh, gossip in one of our earlier sessions. Uh, James opened the the door to my tirade about gossip here a little while ago, a couple of sessions ago, and you thought I was through talking about gossip. But uh, James has a lot more to say about this untamable member of our being. It was in James 1.19, remember he said he, we should be swift to hear, slow to speak, and uh, slow to wrath. And that's, uh, that was a preamble. He was, we're just getting warmed up. And James, and a few verses later, he emphasized that the believer who does not bridle his tongue is not truly religious. And he's using the word religious here in a positive sense. We're going to discover when we get to chapter 4, both in the first verse and verse 11 and 12, that his gang must have had, the people he's writing to, must have had some really rough meetings because he talks about them fighting and screaming at each other. And you can you can just get a glimpse at what their what their uh, board meetings must have been like. The church that he's that they're talking to. But um, one of the things we should really reflect on is the power of speech. It's power. It's very positive in terms of prayer, praise, worship, and leadership. But it's also capable and prone to lies, deceit, and manipulation. You know, it's interesting. You and I, when we're first born, we have a very, very high input rate. If you take the way we gather information, our eyes, most conspicuous, our eyes, ears, proprioceptive, whatever, the bit rate going into our brain, into our computer, can be measured in the millions of bits per second. The bandwidth of, of, of three-dimensional to a double image input is enormous. The output rate is very, very limited. It's measured. The input rate's measured in the millions of bits per second. The output rate's measured in the thousands of bits per second, much smaller. Which means that our brain, has, as we grow from an input, as we grow, is programmed to do enormous, be enormously effective at summarizing, putting things together. 
because of that imbalance. Our input rate is far higher than the output rate. But as we explore our output rate, constricted though it may be, it is primarily verbal. Even those that are fast on a keyboard are discovering the software around where you can talk and it'll type it for you. They're finally getting that working pretty well. The output rate of our mouth is very, very high. It's our most fluent form of expression. Even though body language and other things are important, our ability to output is uh, primarily verbal. And with that, we do major damage, major damage. James is going to deal with this whole issue with six pictures to highlight three uh, basic powers of the tongue. In the first few verses, he's going to talk about the power of the tongue to direct. He's going to talk about a bit like on a horse, horse's bridle, and he'll talk about the rudder on a ship. He opens up in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, and by that he means teachers, I believe, knowing that we shall, we shall receive the greater condemnation. You know, for more, probably about 30 years, I taught Bible studies. And if you listen to my old tapes, you'll know I took great pride that I'm not a teacher. I took the posture that all I was trying to do is get you to do your own homework. And I, and I used to quip about that a little flippantly, saying that I read about what James said about teachers, and I'm not a teacher. I just want to stimulate you to do some learning. Big difference. I have to, you know, yield to the truth, obviously, Especially, I think even probably then, but also in these years, I have to admit that my, I'm going to be accountable as a teacher. And that's scary. Because I know there's many times that I'm not necessarily correct. Even some positions of the past that I've revised in some, to some measure. That accountability is of concern. So if you're teaching, whatever you're teaching, not Bible or whatever, you're in a position of accountability as well as responsibility. And so then he goes on, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. And I'm sure he's speaking hypothetically, because I don't, any perfect men here? Can I see a show of hands? Now, incidentally, he's going to talk about the tongue, but I think he's speaking broadly. I don't think he would exclude the pen from the spoken word. And I have to tell you, I just have to get this off my chest. I find myself staggered at the stuff that gets mailed through the federal mails that masquerades as Christian newsletters, attacking, openly, libeling members of the body of Christ. You know, Matthew 18 has a very explicit procedure uh, for people who have a bone to pick of some kind. It's not public. I guess I'm sensitive to this because for several decades, two or three decades, I taught the Bible, but as a layman, as a hobby thing. I I made my living and my full-time profession was as an executive. Putting companies together, whatever, doing all the usual things people do, whether, you know, uh, as professional executives, professional directors, what have you. And my Christian life was personal, and it was hobby or, or lay, if you will. About seven years ago... I switched gears where I started doing this full time. And the Lord's blessed that, and I believe he's called me to it, so that's all great. But I have to tell you, the adjustment I've gone through emotionally, ethically, really bothers me. I had less ethical problems in the secular world than I have been confronted with in the last seven years. People not keeping their commitments, people saying falsehoods about people in print, If it was a secular world, I could have made a fortune with lawsuits. Don't do that in the Christian world for lots of reasons. First of all, some of these uh, do them a favor by giving that that much visibility. (laughs) Really, you know. uh, But the libel and the slander that is commonplace within the so-called Christian community staggers me. In the secular world, they're not all peaches and creams. They're rough and tumble guys there. But they're smarter than that in general. There's low life there too. But I mean, the real winners may not be moral men. Don't misunderstand. I'm not building a, putting a pedestal. But they've learned the efficient, effective way to win is to have some principles and ethics that you operate by. They may be slow to give a commitment, but when they give it, you can count on it. Anyway, he argues that you can tell the person by his words. 
if a person has control of his tongue, you can probably get, uh, James is saying, he's able to bridle the whole body. The flip side, I think, is what he's also saying. When you, when you encounter someone who can't control his tongue, it should raise substantial doubts about the rest of his character. That's what James is saying. And that's another reason why, as Christians, our mouths are so important. And how many times have you seen someone that you may respect in this Christian situation for many reasons, and then you hear him say something that just punctures the bubble? A slip of the tongue or something that, that uh, it's still forgivable. I'm not trying to build a, you know, a legalistic case here. But how, how, you know, how, how that destroys his testimony of his walk and the rest. Verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. In other words, he's drawing an analogy here. How a small piece of metal in a bridle can control this big, powerful animal, which but for the, those arrangements would be wild and dangerous. And yet, handled properly, he's not only not dangerous, he's controllable, useful, productive, what have you. He's, he's drawing an analogy here. Words turn into deeds. In ourselves, and also in others. This is probably one of the great tragedies of our entertainment media. The entertainment media executives say that our entertainment mirrors the population. Nonsense. The percentage of murders and rapes and immorality on the television is way out of proportion to the, that in the population, as gross as our population is. No, that's nonsense. We're implanting ideas. We're making those things seem common. There's a... Well, I won't start on that one. <laughs> uh, verse 4. James said, Behold also, you know, he used the bit as an example. He's going to use a similar kind of example. He said, Behold the ships which, though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. I don't know if you've ever been to a big shipyard. You, most of us are familiar with boats, you know, in a lake sense or something. The size of the rudder compared to the boat is pretty modest. What's really amazing when you see an ocean going vessel in dry dock. Here's this huge, huge vessel. Take a look at the rudder. It's, it's, it's big in absolute terms. It's trivial in terms of the size of the ship. And yet that rudder is used to control the ship. In storms, cross currents, high winds. It's amazing. You know, just to realize that the helm, which is what controls the rudder, is, is uh, that modest. And what he's saying here, again, he's drawing that analogy of the tongue. You know, during the... Second World War, you've probably seen posters. Uh, Loose lips sink ships. They also wreck lives. Betrayal of a confidence. The innuendo. And do huge, huge damage. It's interesting how the bit and the rudder can control, uh, can overcome, in effect, uh, contrary forces. The wild nature of the horse or the winds or currents, of, if you will, t- that would drive a ship off course. But um, a runaway horse or a shipwreck, of course, can mean injury and death to pedestrians or passengers. So these things are small in contrast to what they're controlling, and yet they hold the destiny uh, far out of proportion to their weight or or apparent uh, uh, significance. I think what James is saying is just a few words at the right place at the wrong time can affect the lives of an accused his family and his friends. They can place a nation at war or they can redirect the lives of a child. How even a yes or no or a nod or something at the right moment can influence an entire life. Let's take the other side. Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter preached at Pentecost in Acts 2. He preached. He spoke. And 3,000 people found eternity, were saved through that. On April 21st of 1855, Edward Kimball went into a Boston shoe store and led a young man to Christ. His name was Dwight L. Moody. When you start talking about this kind of thing, you you quickly discover, you quickly find yourself leapfrogging all through the book of Proverbs. It's amazing to me. It was amazing to me. I thought I was familiar with the book. It was amazing to me. I realized how much of the book of Proverbs deals with the tongue. 
A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Proverbs 15.1. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 12.22. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Proverbs 10.19. Well, okay, so these are two of the six. The bit and the rudder. Now James takes two more to demonstrate the power of the tongue to destroy. And uses fire and beasts as his two examples in the next few verses, 5 through 8. James, verse 5 says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You know, fire can start with a small spark and destroy a city. I can remember as a kid, I, I, I don't know how old I was, I must have been like four, really small, but I somehow got some matches. And I, across the street from our house was a vacant lot, a fairly large vacant lot. And I can remember striking a match and setting that lot on fire. I just, ooh, this fun, you know, I think I could stamp it out. I got away from me and I have just vague memories. Of it. I remember it, but it was very early apparently. But suddenly there's a roaring fire. There are fire engines. There are upset neighbors. No real damage, fortunately. Remember, explained to my mom, it just took one match. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. Well, um, a fire started in a barn in Chicago. The story, it was a, it was a cow that kicked over a lamp. I understand that it actually was some, the kids that were smoking. In it. But that, anyway, at 8.30 p.m. on October 8th of 1871, and that fire spread over 100,000 people were left homeless 17,500 buildings were destroyed, and th- over three, about 300 people, somewhere between 250 and 300 people died. It cost the city over $400 million, and in those days, that dollar is probably worth 20 times what it is today. By the way, that same day, and not, not as well known, it was a dry autumn uh, day that uh, a spark ignited a raging fire in the north woods of Wisconsin, which burned for an entire month, and uh, taking more lives than the famed Chicago fire. Uh, a, a, this firestorm uh, destroyed billions of yards of uh, precious timber, all from one spark. It wasn't as well known. It wasn't, you know, obviously for obvious reasons, but it is also in the records if you look it up. Words, our words can also start fires. In fact, uh, in verse 6, uh, James says, uh, it set on fire the course of nature. I want to tell you another story I came across that uh, I thought gets the point across very well. There were four guys that met by chance on a Saturday night in Denver at the Denver Railway Depot. Al Stevens, Jack Tournay, John Lewis, and Hal Wilshire. Real story. They were newspaper reporters for the Denver Post, the Denver Times, the Republican, and the Rocky Mountain News. Each had been set, uh, sent by their editor uh, to dig up a story, any story. Uh, for the Sunday editions. This was Saturday night. They needed a story for, by the, for tomorrow morning's edition. And so the reporters were in the railroad station hoping to snag some visiting celebrity or something, uh, uh, Frank Freddie or somebody that was coming through, and uh, that might arrive by train. But none arrived. And so the, the four reporters, you know, the competing papers, they happened to met and they were commiserating, and all were facing an empty-handed return to their city desk. And... Uh, Al uh, declared that he was going to make up a story and hand it in, just make up something colorful. The other three laughed at him. That's ridiculous. Someone suggested they all walk over to the Oxford Hotel and have a beer. So they did. Jack said he liked Al's idea about faking a story, but why didn't each of them fake a story and get off the hook? John Jack said, you're thinking too small. Four half-baked fakes didn't really cut it. What they really needed was a real whopper that they all could use. See? Another round of beers. <laughs> a phony story, of course, uh, could be uh, too easy to check, so they started discussing something foreign, uh, some foreign angles that uh, would be difficult to really verify. China was distant enough, so as you read, yes, we'll write something about China. John leaned forward, gesturing dramatically in the dim light of the bar room, and said, try this one on. A group of American engineers stopping over in Denver en route to China the Chinese government is making plans to demolish the Great Wall. Our engineers are bidding on the job. Harold was skeptical. Why would the Chinese want to destroy the Great Wall? 
John thought for a moment. They're tearing down the ancient boundary to symbolize international goodwill to welcome foreign trade. Another round of beers. By 11 p.m., the four reporters had worked out the details of their preposterous story. After leaving the Oxford bar, they'd go over to the Windsor Hotel. They would sign four fictitious names to the hotel register. They'd instruct the desk clerk to tell anyone that asked that four New Yorkers had arrived that evening, had been interviewed by the reporters, and had left early the next morning for California. The Denver newspapers carried the story. All four papers and on the front page. In fact, the Times headline that Sunday read, Great Chinese Wall Doomed, Peking Seeks World Trade. Of course, the story was a phony, a ludicrous fabrication concocted by four capricious newsmen (laughs) in a hotel bar. But their story was taken seriously and was picked up and expanded by newspapers in the eastern United States and then by newspapers abroad. Yeah, whoops is right. When the Chinese themselves learned (laughs) that the Americans were sending a demolition crew (laughs) to tear down their national monument, most of them were indignant. Some of them were enraged. Particularly incensed, were members of a secret society, a volatile group of Chinese patriots who were already wary of foreign intervention. They, inspired by the story, exploded. They rampaged against the foreign embassies in Peking. They slaughtered hundreds of missionaries. In two months, 19,000 troops from six countries joined forces, invaded China with the purpose of protecting their own countrymen. The bloodshed that followed, sparked by the journalistic hoax, hoax uh, invented in a bar room in Denver, became the white-hot international conflagration that's known to every high school student as the Boxer Rebellion. Um, there's a little background here. It was a band of people called the Ai Ho Chian, which, were, which means righteous and harmonious fists. They believed a mysterious boxing art rendered them invulnerable. And the group's origin was supposed to have been maybe originally a self-defense organization uh, uh, during the Taiping rebu- uh, Rebellion, the White Lotus sect, they call themselves. At first, these boxers, as the Western media called them the boxers, and so that became known as the Boxer Rebellion. They first addressed their hostility against the Christ- Christian converts, who had you know, caused many people to abandon their traditional belief system. And, and so they roamed the countryside killing uh, Chinese Christians and foreign missionaries. And from all this anti-Christianist area, it, it, uh, it, uh, it just started to escalate against everything foreign, churches, uh, railways, mines, whatever. And uh, they recruited disenchanted from all segments of society. There was, a lot of, there, was a, there was a drought, so many people were starving and hungry, so they were open to this kind of, of uh, a thing. And this is the 1899-1900 time period. Local authorities had refused to stop the violence at first. The Manchu court was uh, alarmed by the uncontrollable popular uprising, but they took satisfaction at seeing revenge taking, being taken for their humiliation before the foreign powers. And there's, I won't get through all the politics, but the empress and the emperor were at odds, and they end up backing. The, they thought that she was impressed with the boxers' successes, so she not just was neutral, they actually started backing the boxers, and that uh, foreign powers, you know, got even, the whole thing starts to escalate. That started a very famous eight-week uh, siege on uh, Peking. It, the whole thing obviously got way out of hand, and then the, the United States get in the act, and I won't uh, go through the whole history here, but uh, it uh, finally the disturbance settled down in September of 1901. Ultimately ends up humiliating. It collapsed the uh, Qing uh, prestige and all that and so forth. But all this started by what? You know, a group of guys in a bar putting together a lie. Obviously, having no concept of what that might ignite. It's interesting to see what David prayed. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing. 
See, the great tragedy is I don't think any of us have any ability to grasp the evil that a few idle words can cause about a person, his reputation, someone's marriage, the integrity of a church or a business or what have you. But David knew that the key to the, to the tongue was the heart. Matthew twelve thirty four. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I, I can't give that quote anymore. Lou Phelps used to run Word for Today. In those days, he saw to it that my Bible studies were put on the radio. But he very, just as a personal ministry, he took each of my tapes and edited them to get the ahs and the oohs and all the funny, inappropriate things out. So he cleaned them all up for broadcast. What I didn't know, he, all those things he took out, he saved on a tape. <laughs> on one occasion, <laughs> he made a tape by Chuck Missler. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. <laughs> And when you listen to the tape, it's uh, er, e, all, all these fillers that you all, we all tend to use. <laughs> and found a suitable occasion to have a day of reckoning for me. <laughs> so I know every time I see that verse, I think of that, that prank. But anyway, verse 6, James continues, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Our tongue potentially has more destructive power than a hydrogen bomb. Because the bomb's power is only physical and temporal. Your tongue's power potentially is spiritual and eternal. Your proper use of your tongue in the right situation can alter someone's eternity. Hydrogen bomb can't do that. In fact, the tongue controls the bomb, if you want to get argue about it. But anyway, you know, it's amazing within any organization, especially a church or a ministry, when certain people leave or are replaced, what a beautiful spirit of harmony and love takes over from what previously was tense and divisive. It's amazing. Uh, the, the scripture says that in Proverbs 26. Where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth, ceaseth. I think we've all been in organizations. How many, you know, show of hands, how many of you have been in an organization where there's been uh, a, a turbulence or a problem? Well, yeah, okay, so yeah, it's almost unanimous. <laughs> where that one person leaves or moves away or whatever, suddenly everybody gets along. Tongue, the tongue can cause disasters from sin on the inside or pressures from the outside. It's interesting that if we feel abused, let's remember, too, that our Lord was also similarly abused. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the things that he had to bear. One of them was how his enemies talked about him. They called him a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber. When he performed miracles, they attributed those miracles to Satan. Even when he's hanging on the cross... His enemies threw vicious taunts at him. He even records that in Psalm 22. It's one of the things in there that's interesting. He, he, he describes what they're saying, verbatim, actually. Anyway, verse 7. For every now, he, now, now James introduces another model. He talked about fires up till now. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things of the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. Everyone that's married knows that. No, I'm sorry. sorry. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. No man can tame his own heart. How do you tame your heart? Turn with me to Isaiah 6, and I think there's a revealing event that occurs in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 is a famous passage because it's it's where Isaiah is treated to a glimpse of the throne room of the universe, the throne of God. And it describes that in the first few verses. But when you get to verse 5, I want you... This is always in the scripture where someone is confronted with the throne room of God. They always have the same effect. They're not excited. They're crushed. Notice what Isaiah's reaction is. Then said I, woe is me. See, in other words, 
what he's going to be confronted with is the righteous, the blinding righteousness of God in contrast to our sinfulness. That's the thing that grabbed Isaiah right up front here. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. His lips were cauterized by the coal from the altar. Interesting. Can we tame our own heart? I don't think so. I think what James is telling us is that only God can. Only God can. He also, in this verse 8, back in James 3, verse 8, it's, it speaks uh, the tongue as, as full of deadly poison. It's interesting, the most deadly of poisons are the poisons that are tasteless and odorless. And I'm going to suggest to you that's analogous to subtle criticism and slander. Verbal venom that does its work when the victim can't react. It can include a word that's unsaid, the awkward silence, a raised eyebrow, a quizzical look. Any of those can be sent right from the pit of hell. Tongue can break hearts and ruin reputations. It's interesting that every word, Adolf Hitler wrote a book, Mein Kampf. Every word in Adolf Hitler's book cost 125 lives in World War II. Now contrast the words of Hitler with the words of Winston Churchill. Instead of the fanatical ravings and what have you, Churchill's brilliant but very measured sentences pull together a faltering nation for its finest hour. The tongue is like an unruly animal, restless and dangerous. It seeks prey and then pounces and kills. Some animals are poisonous, as are some tongues. And the deceptive things about poisons that can work slowly and visibly. A malicious word that's spread, uncontested, can do great damage to a person, a family, or a church. I guess James's key point here before we go on is that animals can be tamed, but the tongue cannot. You can take animals that weigh tons and train them. You can take a tongue, which is a few ounces, and can't. And obviously the reason you can't is because it's just the amplifier of thoughts that come from the heart. But anyway, uh, James then goes on to two more final ones, the the power of the tongue to delight. And he uses two, the fountain and the tree as his examples here. That gives us six altogether. Verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Now, uh, in most of the world, almost any place you go in the world, even small villages, one of the most prized possessions of most of these settlements is right in the middle of the town is what? A freshwater fountain. Both in its reality and also its symbolism, it represents, uh, uh, you know, blessing, refreshment, life. Why? Because you and I need water. We can go without food for a while, but you can't go without water for very long. Water is necessary for drinking, also for washing, cooking, farming, all kinds of activities necessary for life. And uh, Proverbs 18.4, The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. Proverbs 10.11, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. 13.14, The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. See, water is life-giving, and so our words can give life if they're controlled by the Spirit of God and not our flesh. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, Proverbs 18.21. It's interesting how the floods in the Midwest, we've all seen floods uh, in actual practice or on, on news broadcasts. It's amazing how much uncontrolled water, I mean, how uncontrolled water, how much damage it can do. In contrast, that, of course, is the refreshment of water and the refreshment of the Holy Spirit. Paul's prayer was that he might refresh the saints in Rome when he visited them. He often named Christians who refreshed him. 1 Corinthians 16, 18, and 
Philemon has a couple of verses that mentions that. And water also cleansed. In the tabernacle and in the temple, there was a laver that was for the purpose of washing. God's word is the spiritual water that cleanses us. It's interesting that um, we are washed by Jesus' blood once and for all. That's a judicial cleansing. But the scripture tells us that we should be washed every day. In what? It's a word. It uses a different idiom. The blood is a judicial issue. Washing of the water by the word is a daily affair. Our words to others can cleanse them and sanctify them if those words that we're using have their source in the Holy Spirit. Our word should be like the river in Ezekiel 47 that brought life to everything it touches. You know, do your words bring life, uh, uh, life to everyone it touches? Don't need a show of hands. Proverbs 12:18. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Verse 12. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. See, he's saying, in effect, he's drawing an analogy here, in effect, but a tongue is like a tree. What is a tree? A tree can provide beauty, it can provide shade, and also bears fruit. Our words can help someone find shelter and encourage. Proverbs 10, 21, the lips of the righteous feed many. Jesus said, the words, these words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. Now, the most important thing about a tree is what? Its root system. It has to be healthy and it has to be deep. So you and I need to be like the man in the first psalm. The book of Psalms, it opens Psalm 1. Very simple, beautiful psalm. The blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. There's a secret of prosperity in the first few verses of Psalm 1. And, of course, nourishment is important. It's interesting. Did the Lord need nourishment? Boy, he communed with his father and heard from his father every day. He got his marching orders from his father every day. Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learner that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh morning by morning. He he awakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Mark 1, 35, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. In mor- and in the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. You realize that every morning that you don't get up, find some privacy and have a quiet time with the Lord, you're putting your day in jeopardy. It's so easy to do, and yet, how often do we do it? People say, when should I read my Bible? Question, when are the sheep fed? When do you feed, if you're a shepherd, when do you feed the sheep? In the morning. Morning, best part of the day. If we're going to have tongues of delight, our hearts have to be right with the Lord each morning. Now, by the way, James finishes all this with a warning. There's a warning here. A fountain cannot bring forth two kinds of water. A tree cannot yield two kinds of fruit. So this raises a fundamental question that really underlies this whole passage. The question is, what is your most important stewardship? Your wife is nudging you with her elbow with the family. You might be saying, gee, one of my most important stewardship is to provide for my family, my career, my profession. There's a lot of good lists, and you can defend all of them. What is your most important stewardship? What stewardship eclipses every other priority in life? It should be the stewardship of your heart. Your heart. Where's your heart? I can't discern. Only God can discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. But I can tell where it is by your tongue, unfortunately. Matthew 15, 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. And Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. And I think that's the root truth in 
James chapter 3, first half of James 3, is that the, all of this is symptomatic of the root issue, our hearts. And he's talking to Christians. Not talking to unsaved. He's talking to you and I. Now, one of the writers I consulted and trying to back, get some background here suggested there are 12 words that can transform your life. There are 12 words that can transform your life. You ready? Please. Thank you. I'm sorry. I love you. And I'm praying for you. And we shouldn't be saying that unless we mean it. That's a cliche we use often too frequently, too casually. Twelve words. Please. Thank you. I'm sorry. I love you. I'm praying for you. You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Robert Schuller. I'm always intrigued every time I meet him. He always says, you know, that, that God loves you and so do I. He has that sort of his little trademark. I thought of using God loves you and I'm trying. <laughs> <Doesn't> quite, <laughs> it doesn't quite work, but it's probably, it's probably more honest, right? No. Um, <laughs> oh, I do believe in the spiritual gifts and mine is flippancy. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I think the secret is our heart, and I think that is not a once and for all thing. You can't come down the sawdust trail and it's done. We all tend to think receiving Jesus Christ is a climax. Not that we shouldn't. That's probably the most important decision of your life, is to seriously, wholeheartedly commit yourself to Jesus Christ. Very, very important. But it's a beginning, not an end. That's where it all starts. And James is, in effect, asking throughout his whole epistle, you say you're saved, great, what have you done with it? Where's the evidence? Is there a changed life? Is there obedience? Evidence of obedience. Not perfection. You're going to stumble. Tragically, we all do. And you have to remember the Christian's bar of soap. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that's not a license to excuse ourselves from obedience. We are called to obedience. And that obedience is not a works thing as it's often described. It's not a do's and don'ts thing. It's a question of being diligent over our heart and letting our heart reflect in our walk uh, the character of God. When we screw up, when we fumble, when we say something inappropriate, when we pass on a rumor about someone, when we indulge in gossip, that tragedy isn't just because we may injure a life, a family, an enterprise, a a, a mission or a church. It's tragic for another reason is that we cloud the perspective of anyone else on the character of God. Because if we're Christians, God is expecting us to reflect God's nature. And that's really what James is going to hammer through all the rest of this. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Well, Father, we come before your throne, thankful for this letter you've given us from James. We pray, Father, that this call to obedience will echo your Holy Spirit, Father, in our lives. Not a set of rules, but a set of responses to the greatness of you, of your nature, of your faithfulness, of your truth. We pray, Father, that you would draw each of us more fully into your word. Help each of us, Father, to be more diligent in our time with you every day that we might hear your voice, that we might know your heart, that our lives and our words would reflect your heart and your words, that we might bear fruit, Father, that we indeed might be fruit-bearing trees, that that our words indeed would comfort, encourage, strengthen, and yes, where appropriate, exhort or convict not by our self-righteousness, Father, but rather by the leading of your Holy Spirit. As we commit ourselves, Father, this night into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.